All right, I want to welcome everyone to this virtual meeting of the Northern New England chapter of Sabre. I'm Bruce McClure, the chapter chair, and we always hold our meetings in conjunction with the Gardner Waterman chapter of Sabre in Vermont, Dr. Clayton Truder, chair. Now, I want to start off tonight in the traditional way with our friend Joanne Holbert, who's got a poem for us. Joanne. Yes, up. I do. And it was very difficult to pick which one I was going to do. It was either going to be um, a three verse poem on the education of, Doc, of, of Mr. Jackson, but I found a better one too, and a little shorter. Anyway, the title of this one is On Baseball Fields. On baseball fields, the White Sox blew between their stations, base hits flew, while foreign runners spiked to the plate and rooters grumbled at their fate. They were the blind, no matter how they tried some burly red to slough another curve and blithely ploth about the bags at fearful rate on baseball fields. The fans took up the quarrel, wow! With fearful zeal, they raised the row and barked their fury at disgrace that while the base hits filled the place and wrinkles rose on Gleason's brow on baseball fields. That was published in the Sporting News, page four, October 30th, 1919. And there was a whole slew of poems to choose <coughs> from for the 1919 <coughs> World Series. So, um, uh, mercifully, I have just given you the shorter one. <laughs> so, um, but there are many more if you are so inclined. There you go. Uh, it always brings me joy when Joanne comes to the meetings and uh, agrees to start us off with a poem. So, Joanne, I really appreciate you. Thank you very much. No problem. All right, a couple of things to go over before we get started. Your email containing the bylaws draft will be going out tomorrow morning. If you are a voting member in this chapter and you have chosen the Northern New England chapter as your primary with Sabre, you'll get this email. It will have a proposed bylaws um, document attached to it. And I'm asking everyone to take a closer look and have your comments ready for our upcoming discussion meeting Monday, February 12th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. After that discussion and, and uh, taking into proposed edits and such, we will put it up for a vote. Now, Thursday, February 1st, we're going to be getting together again at 7.30 Eastern time for the semifinals and finals of our Immaculate Grid Tournament. The final four features some of the best baseball trivia minds in Sabre, and you don't want to miss seeing the competition conclude. Sign out links, sign in links go out tomorrow, and it's sure to be a good time. Now, the 15th annual Sabre Day is this Saturday, February 3rd. We have three fantastic guests lined up. Tyler Kepner is the first to dig in with us at 9 a.m., followed by Lindsay Barra at noon and Andy Tootkin at 4 p.m. It's sure to be a fantastic day of celebrating baseball with pitchers and catchers reporting in just a couple of weeks. You can get to sabre.org slash events to click on the Sabre Day link and see all of our events and everybody else's saber day events as well all right now it's on to our feature presentation and tonight we've got ourselves a fantastic presenter jacob pomeranke is saber's director of editorial content he has been a saber member since 1998 and is the chairman and newsletter editor for the black Sox scandal research committee he is the editor of Scandal on the South Side, the 1919 Chicago White Sox, published by Sabre in 2015, and the Eight Myths Out project in 2019. Jacob has also moderated panel discussions at the Sabre annual convention on Shoeless Joe Jackson in 2020, the 50th anniversary of Eight Men Out 2013, and the 100th anniversary of the 1919 World Series in 2019. He has appeared as a subject matter expert on baseball scandals on Major League Baseball Network's Triumph and Tragedy, the 1919 Chicago White Sox in 2010, PBS NewsHour in 2019, and ESPN's Backstory, Banned for Life in 2020. He is also a member of the Baseball Records, Dead Ball Era, and Bio Project Committees, and his work has appeared in the Baseball Hall of Fame's Memories and Dreams magazine. 
I'm not sure Jacob has enough to do, but he's even decided to come in and present to us tonight. And I am thrilled to say this, Jacob Pomranke, my good friend. How you doing? Welcome to Northern New England. Well, thank you for that great introduction, Bruce. Uh, and thank you, Joanne, uh, for the uh, wonderful poem to get us started off here and bring us all back to uh, the 1919, 1920 uh, era. That's uh, always a lot of fun. And you're right, there are quite a few uh, poems of varying quality uh, about the Black Sox scandal. <laughs> a lot of uh, a lot of wannabe poets uh, in the sports pages uh of that era so anyway thank you all for coming uh this is terrific this is actually the 100th anniversary today right now of uh the opening of shoeless joe jackson's civil trial in milwaukee wisconsin against the chicago white Sox. so that's what i'm going to be talking about uh today but i also want to kind of bring you up to speed a little bit about uh what some of our uh, members of the black Sox uh, scandal research committee have been doing the last few years uh, some of you are here uh, today i can see on the uh, on the list of attendees so uh, appreciate uh, all of you being here um, i'm going to go ahead and share my screen i'll go through a few uh, things with the Shoeless Joe Jackson trial and the new book uh, that we published last summer uh, with the trial transcript. And then uh, I will open it up for questions after that. And if you've got any questions, feel free to uh, put them in the chat uh, while I'm talking and I will try to uh, get to as many questions as I can. And then once I'm done with the uh, presentation, uh, we can open the floor for all kinds of questions, anything you want. So let me uh, go ahead and share my screen here real quick. All right, can everybody see that? Excellent. There we go. All right, so uh, Shoeless Joe Jackson, like I said, 100 years ago, he sued the Chicago White Sox, uh, his former employer who had suspended him and eventually uh, baseball banned him for life. Uh, because of his role in the 1919 World Series fix. So that lawsuit was uh, for back pay. He had signed a contract uh, at the beginning of the 1920 season. Um, and <clears throat> basically, I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more detail later, but uh, he basically signed a three-year contract uh, in 1920 for the 2021 20, and 22 seasons. But at the end of the 1920 season, the uh, grand jury met in Chicago and they uh, indicted uh, several of the Black Sox um, and basically he was suspended. Uh, so he did not play in 1921 or 1922. And so uh, he did not get that money uh, that he thought was owed to him. So he sued his former employer. Um, and imagine this happening today. Imagine a star baseball player being suspended and suing his team. Uh, that is something that might happen, but uh, I bet you cannot imagine, because I certainly can't, um, imagine that going to trial. Imagine that, uh, you know, the player and the owner and front office executives and their teammates um, spending, you know, two weeks in a courtroom uh, going over contract negotiations, going over, you know, finances, uh, team, you know, baseball operations, uh, this is something that would never, ever, ever happen today. Um, but it did happen in 1924. Um, this trial, you know, th this lawsuit went to trial um, and it went to trial in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And for two weeks in the winter of 1924, uh, Shoeless Joe Jackson, Eddie, uh, Happy Felsch, Charles Comiskey, and, and many other people involved in the Black Sox scandal um, were, uh, you know, examined and cross-examined uh, by the attorneys on both sides. And so um, we now have the complete transcript of this trial. Uh, it is now available in a new book uh, that we published last summer uh, called Joe Jackson Plaintiff versus Chicago American League Baseball Club Defendant. Um, a very lengthy title for a very lengthy book. Uh, it's about 650 pages. It's a doorstop um, but it is the complete transcript of this trial. And you can go through day by day and see all the witness testimony, um, you know, basically all the lawyers going back and forth, uh, talking, you know, to uh, asking questions of Shoeless Joe, of Charles Comiskey, Harry Grabner, the, uh, the general manager, essentially, of the Chicago White Sox, um, and a lot of other people, including some of the gamblers uh, involved in the Black Sox scandal. So you can read all of their testimony in their own words. 
Um, this is a, a trial transcript that very few people had ever seen before. Uh, this book was published last summer. Uh, Bill Lamb, who I believe is in the audience tonight, uh, was one of them. He wrote a great book uh, about a decade ago called Black Socks in the Courtroom. He was really the first person to ever go through the trial transcript and, you know, look at it with a trained lawyer's eye um, and, and, you know, analyze uh, this trial and actually clear up a lot of misconceptions um, that had formed over the previous uh, 90 years um, about this trial and the other uh, legal proceedings uh, in the Black Sox scandal. So uh, Bill had the uh, good fortune to look at a, a copy of this transcript, um, but I had never seen it and most many other people had never seen it before either. Um, there were only two copies that we know of uh, on the planet. And one of them was the lawyer for Shoeless Joe Jackson, uh, Ray Cannon. His grandson has a copy. And the other copy was actually uh, owned by Jerome Holtzman, a uh, former Chicago sports writer who was Major League Baseball's official historian. Uh, he was named to that post back in 1999 and held that until his death in 2007. And uh, it was Jerome Holtzman's copy of the transcript uh, that we have. That's uh, the Jerome Holtzman's papers were acquired by David Fletcher, my co-editor. Um, he was the founder of the Chicago Baseball Museum. And uh, Fletcher had a copy of this transcript and uh, he wanted to make this available. And so he and I have known each other for about 20 years now. And uh, Fletcher, um, he basically, uh, you know, asked me a couple of years ago, he said, you know, hey, what should we do with this? Uh, we should get this out there. You know, we need to make this uh, transcript available to the public. And so uh, we worked on digitizing uh, the transcript. Originally, the the original transcript from the court reporter uh, was about 1700 pages long. It was double spaced and typewritten um, and a lot of different legal formatting that we had to clean up. Uh, and so we, we were able to digitize it. We were able to clean it up. We were able to correct a lot of the, uh, the spelling errors and grammatical errors and some of the factual errors that were in the original uh, transcript. And we were able to make this available uh, both as an ebook, uh, which makes it very searchable and easy to look through if you're doing some research, um, and also as a paperback edition. So it's, uh, it's finally out there 100 years later. Um, and it's a fantastic resource. You know, this is something that we're hoping that uh, future Sabre members, future writers and researchers, um, you know, anyone who's interested in the Black Sox scandal, uh, we're hoping that, you know, people go through this transcript and find things that we might have missed, um, that we might have not noticed before uh, in this testimony. So it's a really fantastic resource. And we're really proud to be able to get this out there and, and make this available to the public. So just to kind of give you a, a quick little overview of the Black Sox scandal and kind of where this trial fits in uh, to the story. Um, in October of 1919 uh, is when the World Series happened. Uh, best of nine series that year. Uh, uh, that was an experiment that lasted for a couple of years. But uh, the Cincinnati Reds beat the White Sox uh, five games to three. And pretty soon after that, uh, the rumors started flying around baseball um, that the White Sox had uh, intentionally lost the World Series. Um, there were some small papers in Chicago that actually named uh, the eight, seven or eight members of the White Sox who were accused of, of taking bribes from gamblers, um, and they were named that month uh, in October of 1919. So there was a few other stories uh, that fall during the offseason, um, you know, basically uh, accusing the White Sox of throwing the World Series but it took almost an entire year before it was widely known and before the general public, most baseball fans, uh, were aware that all of these rumors uh, had some truth to them. And so in the fall of 1920, uh, at the end of the baseball season, the White Sox were uh, competing for American League pennant again. And uh, in the fall of 1920, a, a grand jury was called in Chicago uh, not to investigate the 1919 World Series, but to investigate a Cubs and Phillies game that was said to have been fixed. Um, but they quickly moved on to the rumors about 1919. And at the end of the month, on September 28th, uh, Eddie Seacott and Shoeless Joe Jackson uh, went to the grand jury and essentially confessed that they had been uh, bribed by gamblers and they had fixed the World Series. Uh, and one day later, Lefty Williams, uh, their teammate, followed them to the grand jury. So uh, three members of the Black Sox uh, testified under oath um, that they had done it. You know, and they, they had thrown the World Series the year before. And so they were immediately suspended by Charles Comiskey, the White Sox owner, um, and eventually banned for life uh, from Major League Baseball. Um, so 
they were indicted for conspiring to defraud their teammates, conspiring to defraud uh, White Sox fans who had bet on them. Um, and that was that was basically the the only charges the prosecutors could really uh, find that would stick. Um, and so a, a trial began in July of 1921 uh, with eight of the uh, Black Sox. One of them, Fred McMullen, uh, was actually uh, never showed up. So he was never uh, on trial. But uh, eight of the Black Sox were indicted. Five of the gamblers were indicted. Um, and uh, the criminal trial took place in Chicago in 1921. Um, but the uh, over the course of this trial, the uh, Black Sox and the gamblers were all acquitted uh, by a jury. And immediately after the jury uh, announced its verdict, um, the jurors and the players all went to celebrate at the same restaurant on the west side of Chicago uh, with some Al Capone connections. Uh, so there's, you know, always been some rumors about uh, about that trial. But uh, as Bill Lamb reports, you know, in his book and, and in many, many articles uh, that he's written about this trial, the trial actually went very well. Um, they had plenty of evidence on the Black Sox. It was uh, mostly a case of the jury uh, wanting to, you know, acquit the uh, players and uh, not really looking at the evidence. So, um, so in 1921, the Black Sox uh, are acquitted. They think, for, you know, immediately that they're going to get back into baseball. But uh, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, uh, baseball's new commissioner, who had just been hired the previous fall, uh, announced that he was going to ban them for life. They would never be allowed to play organized baseball again. Um, and so uh, this this took place in August of 1921. And then the following spring, um, Shoeless Joe Jackson and Buck Weaver and Swede Risberg and Happy Felsch, four of the eight Black Sox, um, filed lawsuits against the White Sox. They had long-term contracts. Um, and so they filed breach of contract lawsuits for, for back pay. Um, and Shoeless Joe filed for $16,000. Um, that's the equivalent of about $230,000 today, I believe. Um, but uh, that was uh, two, two of his three seasons of his uh, three-year contract that he was uh, suing for. And so this uh, lawsuit eventually kind of got consolidated. Shoeless Joe's was the only one of the four players uh, whose lawsuit went to trial. Um, and that trial began in 1924. There were some depositions that happened in the months uh, prior to that. Um, but in January of 1924, it went to trial. And so Shoeless Joe's on one side of the table and Charles Comiskey is on the other uh, with his lawyers. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very dramatic uh, proceedings. So why was this trial in Milwaukee in the first place? Uh, that's the question that I think gets asked more than any other um, about this trial. And the reason is because the Chicago White Sox were incorporated uh, in Wisconsin when the American League was first forming at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, ben Johnson and Charles Comiskey uh, were committed to putting a team in Chicago, but they did not want the Chicago Cubs to know. This was when the National League and the American League were basically at war. Um, and the American League was declaring itself a, a second major league, um, you know, trying to uh, take over um, some of the some of the National League cities. And so they wanted to place a team in Chicago, but they didn't want the Cubs to uh, know about that. And so they secretly held a meeting in Milwaukee, incorporated in Milwaukee, uh, the White Sox Corporation, essentially. Um, and so uh, that's where the White Sox were incorporated. So uh, when Shoeless Joe and his lawyer, Raymond Cannon, went to you know, file a lawsuit, they couldn't do it in Illinois. They had to do it in Wisconsin. So that's uh, why the trial ended up there. Um, and the, as you can see on this uh, slide, the witness list was, uh, was pretty incredible. Um, you know, this was uh, four of the uh, eight Black Sox players were... Um, were uh, testifying or deposed for this trial. Uh, Charles Comiskey, the owner, Harry Grabner, the GM, uh, Alfred Austrian, who was the corporation counsel uh, for both the White Sox and the Cubs, National League President John Hadler, uh, all of them testified. And we have all of their testimony in this transcript uh, in this book. So it's really incredible. Um, you know, and, and Charles Comiskey, just to give you an example here, you know, he was on the stand for most of four days and he was asked all kinds of questions about his own playing career, um, about, you know, again, team operations with the White Sox, uh, you know, the specifics of, you know, the 1919 World Series. Um, he had hired uh, detectives, private detectives, to essentially spy on the Black Sox players, something that got George Steinbrenner suspended uh, many years later with the Yankees. Um, but Comiskey had hired detectives, so he was asked about that. His uh, detective uh, actually took the stand. 
Um, so it, it was really fascinating to read all this testimony. Um, a couple of the, the gamblers uh, who were, you know, insiders in the scandal, uh, Sleepy Bill Burns, former Major League pitcher, and Billy Maharg, uh, who had played a couple uh, games with the Philadelphia Phillies um, a few years back. Uh, they were deposed for this. And so, you know, all of these uh, figures are, you know, going on at length about the 1919 World Series and their own actions uh, before and after the game. So it's really incredible to read their own stories and to go through the testimony to see, you know, just what they had to say uh, a couple of years later. Um, uh, other witnesses included Katie Jackson. She was Joe's wife. Um, and this testimony was actually uh, really crucial. She testified as to uh, the money, the bribe money that Joe received. Um, she was the one who deposited at a bank in Savannah, Georgia, where they were living. Um, and so, you know, she was deposed for this trial. And her testimony is all about uh, taking the money to the bank in Savannah, Georgia. And the bank teller was even deposed uh, for this trial. So there is no question whatsoever that Shoeless Joe took the money. That is, uh, you know, not to spoil uh, any of the, the new research that we've done, but uh, that is... You know, anybody that believes that Shula Show was not involved at all um, or did not take the money, it's not true. Uh, he absolutely took the money. There is no question about it. We have Katie Jackson under oath um, talking about it. We have Shula Show under oath several times talking about accepting uh, a $5,000 bribe. So um, it's all there and it's uh, it's all in the testimony. It's all under oath. Um, you know, again, we've got the detectives, we've got the bank tellers, we've got a lot of handwriting ex uh, experts uh, in here. So really incredible stuff uh, to be able to read, you know, firsthand uh, testimony from all of these figures. So um, so this is kind of, you know, a big part of what you can find uh, in this in this transcript and in this book. Um, so a little bit about the trial itself. The uh, oops, the uh, trial lasted for two weeks and it was a breach of contract lawsuit. Um, and so a big part of the testimony was about, you know, the circumstances of how Shoeless Joe signed his 1920 contract. And if you know anything about Shoeless Joe, you probably know that he was illiterate. He could not read or write. He had very little formal education. Um, like many people of that era, uh, especially in the South and in, in cotton mill towns in South Carolina, where he was from, um, he could not read or write. Now, he could trace his name. He did learn how to trace his name. Um, so there are a number of legal documents and ch checks, paychecks, um, that do have Joe's actual signature. But most of Joe Jackson's signatures, if you ever see them on the memorabilia market uh, or at auction, most of Joe's signatures are actually Katie's. Uh, she read over all of his contracts, any you know legal documents, and she was the one that signed his name for the most part. Um, but there are a few examples, and uh, some of them have sold for you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, there are a few examples of Joe signing uh, his own name. And on this slide, you can actually see this is a compilation of Shoeless Joe's 1919 paychecks, um, which were introduced as exhibits during this trial. Uh, to establish how much he was paid and, and again, the circumstances of, of his contract signing. And so you can see this is Joe Jackson's uh, actual signature. Um, and one of, the, one of the ways you can tell it's Joe's signature is his last name, the J-A-C of Jackson. Um, they do not connect uh, those three letters. And that is usually uh, a pretty good sign that it was actually Joe signing his name. He, he struggled with the pen and he was unable to sign. He was able to, unable to connect those three letters. So when you see that, uh, sometimes, most often that is Joe's actual signature. Uh, but enough people know that now that, uh, you know, you, there are still some forgeries out there too. Um, so these, uh, these paychecks were introduced at trial. Um, and a whole lot of time was spent about the circumstances um, in which Joe signed that contract. And uh, the key question was whether or not um, Katie was there with him uh, when he signed that contract. Harry Grabner, the GM of the White Sox, went down to Georgia. Um, and Joe claimed that Harry signed him to that contract uh, in the car against the steering wheel of his car. Uh, and Katie was not there. She was inside the house. Um, and the White Sox claimed that uh, Katie looked looked it over, and uh, so she knew what he was signing, and you know she knew that he could uh, he could be released uh, from that contract. Mm -hmm. um, and so so that was a, a big part of um, of of how this trial uh, went down. And the other point that was uh, part of this trial is um, again the Black Sox scandal. Did Shoeless Joe actually participate in the fixing of the nineteen nineteen World Series? 
So a lot of the questions for Shoeless Joe, um, especially when he was cross-examined by the White Sox lawyers, um, were talking about the 1919 World Series. And so you get his story about, you know, what he was doing during the World Series and whether he was meeting with the gamblers and whether he accepted the money. And so a lot of the testimony is, you know, covering that ground. Some of it was also covered during his 1920 uh, grand jury testimony as well. And the key part of uh, how this trial played out is Charles Comiskey's lawyers ended up confronting Shoeless Joe and the other White Sox players with their old grand jury testimony. Um, and this is uh, the reason for how the trial uh, ended up the way it did, because uh, this was something that when the pre-trial depositions were happening before the uh, in 1923, um, Shoeless Joe was deposed uh, twice before the trial began. And uh, the White Sox lawyers did not confront him with his 1920 testimony at that time. They waited till he was on the stand in Milwaukee in 1924. Um, and he was, you know, basically by himself. He had to answer these questions. Um, you know, his lawyer could could help him, but, uh, you know, not while he was on the stand. And so Shoeless Joe was confronted with his old grand jury testimony. And in 1920, in the grand jury, he basically admitted everything. He said, you know, I took the money. Um, you know, the, the, I was part of the fix, you know, we were trying to lose more games, uh, than we did, you know, and so in 1920, um, you know, his guilt is, is basically well established. And by 1924, um, his story changes a lot. And when he is confronted with his old grand jury testimony, um, Comiskey's lawyers are asking him, you know, were you asked this question and did you make this answer? And over a hundred times, he said, no, I was not, I was not asked that question and I did not make that answer. Um, you know, including very uh, damning answers, you know, like, did anyone pay you any money uh, to help throw that World Series? And his answer in 1920 was, yes, they did. Um, and in 1924, he said, no, I never said that. Um, and so this is uh, really the key moment um, in this trial is Shoeless Joe uh, basically refuting his old grand jury testimony. Um, and you can see this very clearly. It happens over a hundred times in his 1924 testimony. Um, and, and they go through it line by line. And so, you know, not only do you get to see his 1924 testimony in this transcript, but you also get to see most of his 1920 grand jury testimony. And the same is true for Eddie Seacott and Lefty Williams, who also testified and who also were confronted with their old grand jury testimony. So, uh, so it's really fascinating, you know, to go through. This is primary documentation um, of what happened in these courtrooms. And we, you know, very few people have ever seen this before. So it's really fascinating to have this on record, to be able to go through, you know, page by page and see uh, what Joe said, you know, on the, uh, on the stand in that courtroom. Um, but, you know, as we can see, uh, his, his answers in this trial, um, you know, left a lot to be desired. And so the trial uh, ended in a very dramatic way. The jury awarded Joe Jackson his back pay. Um, they, uh, they, you know, same thing that happened in, in Chicago three years earlier. Um, the jury, you know, in some ways disregarded the facts and the evidence of the case. Um, and they, you know, awarded Joe his back pay. They said that the White Sox and their lawyers were not convincing. Um, but the judge in this case, John J. Gregory, um, a very experienced uh, judge, um, he was very mad at Joe Jackson, and he cited Jackson with perjury uh, even before the verdict was was announced. Um, and he, Gregory said, basically, you're lying either in 1920 in the grand jury testimony or you're lying now. It doesn't matter which one, you know, when you're lying. I think you're lying here in Milwaukee. Um, but, you know, you came to the wrong state, to the wrong city, the wrong court. Um, and so he cited him with perjury, uh, had him thrown in jail for a couple of hours. Um, and also Happy Fels, who, who did the same, uh, you know, was cited uh, for perjury as well. And so uh, Judge Gregory set aside the verdict. Uh, he reprimanded the jury, um, called them out publicly. That is also in this transcript. Um, you know, many lawyers that we have talked to uh, who have read this transcript, you know, have said they went through entire careers and never heard a judge uh, say the things that this judge said to the jury. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so that's uh, it was it was very dramatic. 
um, in how it ended. So even though Jackson won the verdict uh, from the jury, um, similar to the criminal trial, uh, he was ultimately denied, you know, the, the, Court, his appeals were denied, and and you know if he received any money at all from the White Sox, it was pennies uh, years later. And same thing for the other players who had sued too. So uh, a very dramatic ending uh, to this trial, and you know this is uh, basically the final chapter of the legal proceedings. Uh, you've got the original grand jury, you've got the criminal trial in Chicago, and you've got Shoeless Joe's civil trial a hundred years ago. Uh, in Milwaukee. And those are the three major chapters in the legal proceedings uh, for the Black Sox scandal. And so that's the one that happened 100 years ago. And now you can uh, read it uh, in this transcript. And so to give you a quick little summary of kind of the aftermath of, of this trial, um, Ray Cannon, who was Shoeless Joe's lawyer, uh, he was elected to Congress, served three terms uh, for Wisconsin. His son, Robert Cannon, became the first executive director of the Major League Baseball Players Association, the Players Union, uh, in the 1950s. Uh, so Robert Cannon was the executive director uh, before Marvin Miller uh, came in about a decade later. Uh, it was Robert Cannon uh, who, who served as the director of the Players Union. And it was Robert Cannon who basically saved this transcript um, because there was a, a city clerk in Milwaukee in the 1950s uh, who found the trial transcript and the exhibits in a box. Uh, they were going to throw them out. And uh, they called Robert Cannon, who was a very well-respected judge in Milwaukee at the time, and said, you know, hey, this is one of your dad's you know, most famous trials. Uh, do you want this transcript? And he said, absolutely, we'll keep it. Um, and so if not for Robert Cannon saying yes uh, in the 1950s, we would probably have never seen this trial transcript ever again. So uh, Robert Cannon and the Cannon family allowed a few authors and researchers to look at the transcript, uh, including Donald Grotman in 1979, um, and also Gene Carney, uh, the founding chair of Sabres Black Sox Committee. Um, Gene and David Fletcher uh, saw the uh, transcript in 2003, and they went up to uh, Tom Cannon, uh, Robert's son, and they went up to Tom Cannon's office in Milwaukee um, to, to go through. And Tom Cannon and uh, Jerome Holtzman had the trial transcript bound in these three, uh, three books, um, and so they were able to go through, uh, go through the transcript um, and so Gene Carney, when he wrote his book called Burying the Black Sox in 2006, um, he included a couple chapters about the Milwaukee trial. Um, he was one of the first of kind of the new generation of Black Sox uh, historians uh, to focus on the Milwaukee trial and, and to talk about it because it's rarely mentioned uh, in much Black Sox literature before then. It's, it's not mentioned much at all in uh, Eight Men Out or in the film. Um, the film kind of ties uh, some of the trials together. Um, some of the trial elements together. Uh, but Gene was able to kind of, you know, go through that trial. His notes are now at the Shoeless Joe Jackson Museum, uh, all the notes that he took from the trial transcript. Um, and so, you know, he was one of the first to really go through it. And then a couple of years later, um, David Fletcher acquired uh, Jerome Holtzman's files, including uh, his copy of the transcript. So uh, that's the one that you can find in our book. So, um, so it's it's fantastic to have this uh, available. It's you know it's great to go through it all. You know, a few members of our Black Sox committee have now uh, gone through it and are starting to use it. Um, you know, Bill Lamb again has uh, you know fantastic book Black Sox in the courtroom. Um, you know, but he's also written for the Baseball Research Journal and for our Black Sox newsletter. Um, you know, with you know many on many many different aspects of not only this trial but also the the previous two uh, legal proceedings. And so it's just a fantastic resource um, to have this available and and to be able to you know read firsthand their testimony. Um, in that courtroom. So in uh, 2022 uh, is when, you know, we began digitizing, David Fletcher and I, uh, we began digitizing and cleaning up the original uh, transcript from Jerome Holtzman's files. And uh, in the summer of 23, right before the Sabre Convention in Chicago, uh, last July, we uh, we published that book through Eckhart's Press. So um, it's now available, uh, the paperback and also the ebook, the PDF. Um, are both on sale at Eckhart's Press and, uh, and Amazon. Um, you know, if you uh, want to see a copy, uh, I'm happy also to, uh, to share a, uh, a PDF copy of the uh, transcript as well. So, um, so yeah, no, this is, uh, you know, fantastic to, to have us out there. This is something we've, you know, really been uh, hoping to make available and, and, 
you know, now it's finally here. So we're working, David Fletcher and I are working uh, on a companion book, um, possibly later this year or next year um, with a little bit more legal analysis uh, of the trial. Uh, most of our book last summer uh, is just the transcript. Uh, you know, we've got some introductions and a few other chapters to explain uh, some of the context of who all these people are and what's happening uh, in this courtroom. But um, but most of this book is the transcript. And so uh, you can read it firsthand and uh, go through it all. So uh, I will stop sharing my screen now and open this up for questions. So in order for questions this evening down the bottom of the screen, you will see the reactions button. Click that and click the button that comes up that says raise hand and we will get you in for questions to with uh, Jacob Pomeranke. I'm already seeing people do that. That's great. I want to just grab one before I go to a uh, sport this evening. Um, why do you think it is, um, Jacob, that the myths of 1919 hang on so tightly with the average baseball fan today? Is it eight men out? Is it just, we don't want to give up the stories? What do you think that is? So I will say Hollywood has a huge role to play here. Um, you know, more people have watched the movie Eight Men Out uh, than have ever read the book. Um, you know, and so the book's been out for over 50 years. And uh, but that movie, you know, still gets shown on MOB Network, still gets shown all over cable. Um, and I think, you know, and it also, you know, as we sh showed in our Eight Myths Out project a few years back, you know, the movie introduces new errors um, that the book didn't even have. Yes. And so it's, you know, just uh, that that movie is kind of the, you know, and the book um, are both kind of the elephants in the room. Um, most people still discover the Black Sox scandal story through Eight Men Out. And that was true for myself um, and probably most of you here, I would, I would assume. Um, Eight Men Out was the first place you learned about the Black Sox scandal. And I think that's going to be true for a long, long time. Um, in part because of the films. The films are, you know, both very popular, uh, both Eight Men Out and Field of Dreams uh, one year later in 1989. You know, today you've got a new generation of people learning about the Black Sox scandal through Field of Dreams. Um, so, you know, I think those are always going to be there and those myths are always going to be there. Um, you know, any any subject of American history um, has a lot of myth attached to it, I think. And, and you know, that's something that we're always going to have to combat, um, you know, but we're doing our part. We're trying to, uh, you know, set the record straight. We're trying to correct some of those misconceptions. Um, I think, you know, in the past few years, we've done a pretty good job uh, within Sabre, within the baseball community um, at, you know, sharing some of the new yep. research that we've done and, and spreading some of that knowledge. Uh, but, you know, it's going to take a while before all those myths are, are dead because, you know, people keep repeating them, you know, and every single time, Amen Out shows up on MLB Network in the off season. Uh, you know we're going to have to repeat it all over again. So it's just you know something that uh, I think anyone who studies history understands that this is just this is part of the process. Is you know people mm -hmm. learn from a flawed source, and you know I don't want to disparage Eight Men Out too much because you know it is part of the reason that we're still talking about this. I mean, if not That's for sure for that book and not for those films, you know it's possible we would not be paying this much attention. Uh, to the Black Sox scandal in 2024. But, you know, it is, uh, it is, you know, it's always going to be there. It is the elephant in the room. And uh, I think that's something that we, you know, are going to just have to live with. Well, we've got a lot of questions for you tonight, Jacob. So I'm going to go right off first to uh, Joseph J. Sport Truder, who is here tonight. You know, he looks a little like the chair of the Gardner Waterman chapter <laughs> over in Vermont. Clayton, how you doing tonight, my friend? <laughs> But unfortunately, he does. Hey, th thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob, for a fantastic presentation. We had Bill Lamb a few years back, uh, right before COVID, present, present to the Vermont chapter. I missed the first couple of minutes, but that was great. Can't wait to read the book. I'm wondering about Arnold Rothstein, who's become just such a major figure in popular culture, dating all the way back to the Great Gatsby, all the way through Boardwalk Empire. He's this figure of fascination. How accurately do you think he is presented on film in these different places compared to what you see have seen in the trial transcripts? Well, you know, I, I don't want to speak about Boardwalk Empire necessarily, but certainly in Eight Men Out, um, I think, you know, in general, he was portrayed fairly accurately. Um, you know, he did want to keep his name out of the scandal. 
Um, you know, he did want to stay above the fray and, uh, he, but he also, you know, did want to make a lot of money from it. And so, you know, he definitely had a hand in financing the scandal and paying off the players, um, through his Lieutenant Nat Evans, his, his trusted business partner, um, and also Sport Sullivan, uh, you know, your, uh, your pseudo namesake for tonight. Um, and so, you know, Rothstein was definitely involved. Um, you know, but he was able to keep his name out of it. He was able to, you know, stay away from the indictments. Um, but, uh, you know, but he was, he was very heavily involved. And I think that's something that, um, you know, was, was generally accurate about eight men out, you know, Rothstein, uh, was not the mastermind, um, because he never, he didn't come up with the idea himself. That was the players, uh, who pursued this, but, um, you know, but Rothstein was the money man. He was the big bankroll. That was his nickname. And uh, he absolutely financed, you know, the fix and, and helped pay off the players. And, uh, you know, he had his hands in a lot of different areas and, and this was one of them. And so, um, you know, as far as how the films and, and the books uh, portray him, I think it's generally pretty accurate. Um, you know, obviously I never met the guy, so I don't know, you know, how he talked or, um, you know, mannerisms or any of that sort of portrayal, the, the way we know that, uh, you know, Shoeless Joe was not uh, close to like Ray Liotta uh, you know, <laughs> a fast talking, uh, New Yorker, uh, who batted right-handed. Um, you know, we, we know that portrayal of Sheila's show is wrong, but, uh, but Rothstein, you know, it seems like, uh, it's fairly accurate. I would say. Thank you so much. What a great presentation. What a pleasure. Steve King in the chat has a great comment. He says, I would disagree with calling the movie eight men out to include errors. John Sales was not making a factual movie. For example, he purposefully left Chris, Christy Mathewson out because of time constraints mike halpert responded by saying steve makes a good point historical movies are often based on actual events wording that hollywood uses this allows them to add drama condense events and limit the number of characters in a movie to make it easier to follow this is a very interesting um comments jacob do you think that eight men out was made as one of those movies that was sort of factual or where was he was it trying to be done to be a bit of a bio biographical pick no it was certainly you know made to be a drama um it was made to be a compelling drama it was a compelling drama i mean the movie itself i mean i love the movie for so many reasons i mean the cinematography is amazing the oh, yeah. cast the ensemble cast is incredible uh the costumes are wonderful the music the score um you know it's a really entertaining movie mm -hmm. um and you know i don't i can't speak for anybody else but i certainly am not looking for it to be a documentary um however the way that it portrays the scandal happening which is based on a very flawed source eight men out the book um, the way that it portrays that scandal is not very accurate at all. And those are not filmmaking decisions of cutting characters or condensing uh, events. I mean, you know, in some cases, they are literally making things up. Um, you know, the the uh, hitman character that supposedly threatened um, Lefty Williams before game eight. I mean, that was a character that was invented by uh, Elliot Asimov. I mean, that, that, that yes. never happened. The character did not exist. You know, it's in the film as if it happened, and many people believe that it did happen, but it didn't happen at all. Um, the the probably the most famous part of the Eight Men Out film, um, you know, that people really do believe happened is the uh, the theft of the grand jury records. And there was a theft of you know some of the transcripts from the prosecutor's office after a very contentious election in 1920. Um, but the trial, uh, the grand jury testimony from the players was read right back into the record during the trial. It was part of the trial. Um, so there was, you know, th this minor theft of, of copies of the transcripts um, had nothing to do with the verdict, had nothing to do with the trial itself. Um, you know, and so there's, you know, been some auction houses that have put up a million dollar reward trying to uh, anybody that can find these stolen records. Um, you know, it was a transcript. The stenographers recreated it just the way they created the first one. Um, so, you know, the, the, that was part of the film. Again, you know, you can, you can argue that this is part of the drama, but it's also 
you know, completely untrue. And so, you know, it, it gives the wrong impression. Uh, it also gives a wrong impression that, you know, it wasn't the players themselves who came up with the idea. It was the gamblers, you know, who tried to pick off the players and figure out which ones were most susceptible to bribery. Um, when in reality, it was Chick Gandall and Eddie Seacott who approached the gamblers, who also approached their teammates. Um, you know, they are the ones who came up with uh, with the idea itself. So, you know, again, nobody's looking for a documentary necessarily, but if you are looking for anything remotely close to the real history, you know, Eight Men Out really doesn't have much of it. Um, but it's got a beautiful movie, great cast, you know, great music. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, very entertaining, very compelling. Um, but it's not history, and most Hollywood films are not. Let's keep going with questions. My good friend Donna Muscarella is here this evening. She's got a question for you. Donna, you're up. How are you doing tonight? I'm well. How are you? I am terrific. I'm so happy you're here, my friend. Go Me get them. Me too. Me too. Hey, Jacob. <laughs> great presentation. Thank you, Donna. Um, keeping along uh, the same lines of this discussion about Eight Men Out, the film, I was wondering if you had ever pursued uh, – an engagement with the MLB network doing something similar to what they do on Turner classic movies, where you could give an intro to the film and say, Hey, this is, this isn't just kind of to, to help debunk all of those myths that the book and the film created. I would love to be a part of that and to, uh, you know, have members of our black Sox committee be a part of that. Um, I don't know that MLB network is very interested in doing that. They, uh, they actually have their own uh, film production um department uh but unfortunately they uh got rid of that department uh seven or eight years ago um that was the crew that produced the uh triumph and tragedy uh documentary and and several other really good documentaries um for specifically for mlb network uh in the early 2010s um but uh, i don't know that they're necessarily interested in interested in doing something like that but if they are uh they certainly know where to find me and find uh members of our committee because we would very much be interested in uh giving that introduction and in part that's why we did the eight myths out project in 2019 was uh to give an introduction to people and say hey here's you know the stuff that we, we've been working on here's the new research here's where you can dive deeper uh and find out more because a lot of people are you know going to have questions uh, especially as these 100th anniversaries have come up over the last five years. We're, we're five years into celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Black Sox scandal. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'd be happy to, to be part of anything like that, but uh, they'll, they'll have to make that decision for themselves. Okay, thanks. Roger Kaplan is here this evening. Roger, you're up. I have two comments. Uh, first of all, the film Eight Men Out, was supposed to be set in Chicago. They didn't have uh, the buildings anymore. They tore them down. It was actually filmed in downtown Cincinnati. But um, where I'm from, it seems like there's a lot of talk about how the Reds would have won that series anyway. By the way, I'm from Cincinnati. Yeah, so that's a great question, and I agree with you that the uh, the Reds were probably just as good as the White Sox uh, that year. They certainly had a much deeper pitching staff. They had five top-line starters, and the White Sox were relying only on two starters uh, for a best-of-nine World Series. So even if they were playing their best, you know, Eddie Seacott, the ace, you know, might have had to start four times uh, in a nine-game series. That's, uh, that's a hard ask of anybody. So the Reds, you know, had a great lineup. Uh, you know, Hall of Famer Eddie Roush, the center fielder, um, you know, was uh, was top of the line there, and, and their pitching staff was very deep. So uh, I'm of the opinion the Reds uh, had a very, very good chance uh, to beat the White Sox if that World Series had been played on the level. But unfortunately, uh, we know for sure that it was not played on the level. So we'll never know. Well, we always have Stratomatic, so... That might help. Uh, Alan Thurston, you're up. How you doing, Alan? Oh, hi. hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you great. Oh, good. I'd like to thank you, Jacob, for uh, doing this, for doing this, publishing this. It's been great. It was a great read. I loved it. <laughs> and, and I'm probably, the, I don't know if I'm the only Joe Jackson supporter here tonight, but I was gratified as Donald Gropman was and the great Gene Carney was to find material in the so it's favorable to Joe that is you don't mention. 
for example, I think the exchange of letters yeah, between Kaminsky and Joe and, a month after the series. Uh, oh, can you hear me? That's a little bit you're, better. You're, you're, you're having a little trouble with, with bandwidth tonight, yeah. uh, Alan. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was having some trouble hearing you. Hello? <laughs> yes, we can We can hear you a little bit. We can hear you. Go ahead, Alan. Hello? Oh, dear. Okay. I think Alan is having a little bit of trouble right. here. <laughs> Alan, if you can hear us, put I your think question transcripts that I was... And we will... Um, yeah. Well, I'll ask it in the chat for you. I'm going to go to Gary Joquin. Gary, you're up. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, fascinating presentation. What I'm often wondering about is, are we heading towards a 21st century version of the Black Sox scandal as the gambling industry embeds itself more and more deeply into professional sports? That's a great question, Gary. Um, you know, I don't think the Black Sox scandal can happen in exactly the same way as it did in 1919. There's too many uh, too many changes in the circumstances. Um, but are we heading for another gambling scandal or possibly a fixing scandal uh, in professional baseball? I think it's inevitable. I really do. Um, I think the opportunity and the money is so high. Um, and, you know, we're already seeing this. And I, I saw somebody mention in the comments, um, college baseball has had multiple scandals in the past year. Um, University of Alabama coach, uh, I believe one in Cincinnati, uh, lost his job this year. So, um, you know, we're already seeing scandals related to the legalization of sports betting. Um, and I think it's only a matter of time before we see more in Major League Baseball and also Minor League Baseball. Um, now, is it going to be exactly the same as the Black Sox scandal where, you know, players themselves are bribed? Um, to throw big games or even possibly a World Series. Um, I don't believe that'll happen, but, you know, we've already had scandals in the past decade or two decades, um, you know, where referees and officials uh, or umpires, um, you know, have been bribed. You know, they're not making nearly the salaries that major league players are. Um, there are many, many other people involved in the game of baseball um, that have some type of effect on the results on the field, um, you know, who can be bribed, um, you know, and, and I'm thinking principally of, you know, coaches, trainers, video replay coordinators, you know, you name it, umpires, officials, um, you know, there's a lot of people that, uh, that have an influence on the game um, that are not making, you know, 30 or $40 million a year, like, you know, Shohei Otani or whatever. Um, you know, so I, I think th there is going to be a scandal. There will probably be many scandals. Um, now, you know, how Major League Baseball reacts and, and handles those scandals, I think is going to be the big question. You know, they certainly have a lot of incentive to make sure that nothing like the Black Sox scandal happens again. Um, but, you know, we're talking about human beings here and, and people are people and, and somebody's going to cross the line. And, you know, we've seen professional football players uh, get suspended for betting on NFL games. Um, I think it's only a matter of time for uh, that trickles down to baseball as well. Um, you know, we haven't even touched the surface of executives, uh, you know, front office people uh, gambling on sports and, and, you know, none of them have been punished yet, but uh, you know, that's certainly coming down the line again, people employed uh, in the baseball industry. So I think it's only a matter of time and we're seeing this all around the world. We're seeing this, you know, in other sports. Um, so basically it's coming in baseball. It's just a matter of how and when and how bad it's going to be. Interesting. Tom Harkins, you're up. Tom, how you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. Great pre presentation. I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, when it comes, comes to the Black Sox, I always felt Buck Weaver got a bad deal. I noticed he wasn't on the uh, uh, the witness list. Was was he mentioned in the trial at all or in the transcript? Uh, what what happened there? He was mentioned, um, you know, by the other players and and by Sleepy Bill Burns and Billy Mahari, the two gamblers who were deposed. Um, Buck Weaver had actually filed his own breach of contract lawsuit, um, and so he was w the only one of the four Black Sox players that was not represented by Ray Cannon in Milwaukee. Felsch, Risberg, and Jackson were. Buck Weaver had his own lawyer in Chicago, um, but Shoeless Joe's went to trial first, and so they were all the players were kind of waiting for Shoeless Joe's trial to wrap up before. Uh, deciding whether they could even proceed uh, with their own lawsuits. And once Shoeless Joe's verdict was set aside, um, essentially, you know, they had no case. So they uh, th those those got settled. Um, and I think Buck Weaver did receive a couple hundred dollars, um, you know, for 
essentially court fees uh, for that lawsuit. But um, you know, as far as Buck's involvement in the Black Sox scandal, Bill Lamb and I have been going over this for quite a long time now. Um, you know, he he has a much harsher opinion of Buck Weaver than I do. Um, but uh, you know, the evidence really does show that Buck Weaver did participate in the meetings. Um, he absolutely was part of multiple meetings, both before and during the World Series, uh, where gamblers were present, um, you know, and, and by most accounts, he was an active participant in those conversations. Um, now, did he receive the money? There's no evidence of that. Um, that has remained true for 100 years. Um, not to say we won't find evidence one day, but right now there's no evidence that Buck accepted the money. Um, however, um, you know, as Bruce Allardyce and Don Saminda and a few others have shown uh, the White Sox continued throwing games in 1920. Uh, we are absolutely sure of that. Um, they might have thrown up to a dozen games in the 1920 regular season. And Buck was on the team. And, you know, he was accused by multiple teammates in 1920 of helping to throw games. So, you know, if he did not get paid in 1919, that's not to say that he wasn't getting paid somehow in 1920. And, and same thing with the other players. We just, we have no evidence of that yet. So it's possible we might find some. Um, but, you know, between... The fixing of the 1920 games and his participation in the 1919 meetings, um, you know, he did have some involvement uh, for sure. You know, whether he played his best, whether he, you know, took the bribe money, we don't know. Um, there's still a lot of question marks about that. But, you know, he was definitely part of the scandal and he definitely, uh, you know, should have been punished at some level. But the degrees of guilt vary so widely um, among, you know, everybody involved. Um, you know, Chick Gandel's degree of guilt is much greater than Buck Weaver's, um, no matter how you look at it. But, you know, they all got banned for life. So they all got the same punishment. My good friend, Dixie Tarango. Dixie, you're up. How you doing tonight? I'm doing fine. Gus is here. That's all we need. There you go. Uh, Bruce, I just want you to realize that I've got 43 people on my screen, which shows and proves that if you have a great topic, and you invite a superstar to talk about it, other superstars will come about. I we agree. got Bill Lamb, my golfing buddy up there in Meredith. We got Donna, the photographer. We've got Joanne, the poet. We got Peter Mancuso, Francis Kinlaw. The whole place is amazing. My question for Jacob and maybe even Bill Lamb, if you want to chime in, you've been at this for 20 to 25 years. To People in the peanut gallery, like me, it seems that there couldn't possibly be anything else out there to find. But yet, every year, every two years, somebody finds something. Is there anything out there you are still looking to find or you think might be out there for you to find? The answer, unsurprisingly, is yes. We are still looking, and I hope one day we'll be able to find um, you know, we still don't have a full transcript of the 1921 criminal trial. We've got bits and pieces of it um, in, at the Chicago History Museum and, and through newspaper reports, but we don't have a full transcript of that. We also don't have a full transcript of the 1920 grand jury. Uh, I mean, there were dozens and dozens of witnesses. Half the New York Giants testified uh, in the 1920 grand jury. And, you know, we don't have their testimony other than what might have been reported in the newspapers. And that was wildly different depending on which paper you read. Um, so, you know, those two in particular, just from the courtroom stuff, uh, you know, we're still looking for, and maybe one day we'll find, we don't know. Um, there's a, a diary that was kept by Harry Grabner, the White Sox, uh, general manager. Um, we know that exists because Bill Veck found it and Bill Veck wrote about it in the 1960s. Um, you know, he was keeping a diary, uh, throughout the entire Black Sox scandal. Um, and we've got a couple, uh, small pages of that, but where's the rest of it? You know, maybe one day we'll find it. Um, you know, I, I could have sworn there would not be any new film footage of the 1919 World Series, but about 10 years ago, we found film footage. Um, you know, a Chicago filmmaker uh, up in Ottawa, Canada, um, was, you know, found a, a newsreel, uh, five minutes of mostly game action from games one and game three of the World Series. Um, and it's now on YouTube that you can watch. So, you know, it, I don't know what's next, um, but all I can tell you is we're having a lot of fun uh, finding it and making it available because this is one of those stories that just, it never dies. I mean, it's, there's, there's something interesting about it. You know, it, it contains so many universal, you know, human elements to this story, you know, the drama, the injustice, betrayal, corruption, you know, redemption, you've got everything in this, in this one baseball story. And so, you know, we're, we're still, 
talking about it 100 years later, we're still fascinated by it. And we're still learning more about it. And I think that's the thing that, you know, is not true for everything. There's there's a lot of baseball stories where, hey, this is what happened and that's it. And there's no larger meaning. There's no, you know, there's nothing all that interesting. But, you know, even in the last few years, I mean, the question earlier tonight about, you know, the legalization of sports betting and what that means. Well, the Black Sox scandal has a lot to do with that. And, you know, both past, present and future of, you know, baseball and betting and how they've been intertwined over the years. So, uh, you know, the next time there's a World Series scandal, you know, even with the Houston Astros, um, we were getting questions about the uh, about the Black Sox and how that compared. Um, so the more we keep learning about the scandal and the more that, you know, it keeps popping up, uh, I think, you know, it's just it's it's a lot of fun to research. I can tell you that. Can't speak for Bill, but uh, I, I have a feeling he enjoys uh, a lot of this research as well, and and a few of you uh, who are in this crowd. So it's it's a lot of fun to uh, to write, to research, to read about other people doing. So uh, I don't know when I'm ever going to get tired talking about it, but it's not today. I can tell you that. About all that testimony that is missing, who is the prime culprit that would have official testimony from a courtroom be gone? How is that possible? Oh, I mean, so many records have, have been lost over the years. I mean, you know, these are courtroom records. So um, essentially, the, the, you know, the court clerks or the city departments that would keep these records, um, you know, they might have gotten rid of them 80 years ago. They might have gotten rid of them in the 1950s, just like this trial uh, in Milwaukee. Um, you know, things happen. Buildings burn. Um, you know, records get tossed. Nobody knows what they are. Um, and then you, you just never see them again. Um, you know, it's a, unfortunately, you know, it's a mistake to think that, you know, all these institutions, um, keep great records. I mean, we know just from major league baseball that most teams do not have good records of their own history. Um, if we're lucky, if their own records go back to the 1980s, let alone the 1880s for the, you know, Cubs or giants or somebody, um, you know, the, these teams don't have their own history. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's the case here as well. It's, you know, we hope in many cases that these records have not been thrown out and that they're sitting in someone's attic or someone's basement somewhere or in a courthouse in an archive that has never been touched. Um, but more than likely, the records are gone and we'll, we'll never find them. But, you know, you never know. So Alan did get to plug his comment into the chat. I'm going to read that to everyone. It says Alan Thurston. Alan Thurston as a Joe supporter. I was happy to find material that bolstered Joe's case. Joe exchanged letters with Comiskey a month after the series, writing that he wanted to return to Chicago to clear his name and tell what he knew. As Gene Carney wrote, Comiskey brushed him off. Comiskey on the witness stand admitted Joe came to his office after the series, waited an hour, and Comiskey did not see him. Joe was asked on the witness stand why he testified during the grand jury that he said he was ashamed of himself because Austrian suggested that he say that evidence Joe was coached by Comiskey's attorney. Any comments on that? Yes. So the uh, the letters back and forth between Jackson and Comiskey were actually exhibits during this trial. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have uh, the contents of all of them, but some of them were read into the record. So they are part of this, uh, this transcript. Um, so we do actually, you know, have that evidence that, um, that, you know, Joe and Comiskey, uh, were sending letters back and forth. Um, Joe did offer to come, you know, to Chicago, uh, to tell what he knew, um, you know, or supposedly we don't know because those meetings never happened. Comiskey did brush him off. That is absolutely true. Um, you know, as far as how this, you know, may or may not strengthen the case of Joe Jackson. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the main point here is that, um, Charles Comiskey was not innocent, uh, by any means. Um, he had many, many opportunities to learn more about what his own team was doing, about what his own players were doing, um, you know, both during the World Series and afterwards. Um, but, uh, you know, in many cases, Comiskey and, you know, his uh, his business partners, uh, Harry Grabner and Alfred Austrian, um, you know, they chose to look the other way. They chose to close their eyes and sweep it under the rug and, you know, try to make this all go away. Um, that was in their best interest, uh, you know, running the Chicago White Sox baseball team. Um, so, you know, does that make them look worse? Absolutely. Um, does that make Shoeless Joe look better? Um, I don't know that I share that opinion, um, but, you know, they 
Comiskey and the White Sox and many baseball officials um, did have a lot of opportunities to uh, do something about it. Um, and, you know, if, if, if nothing else, to learn more about, you know, what was happening right in front of them. Uh, and they chose not to. So that is that is definitely a failing on their part, for sure. Let's go back to Roger Kathman. Roger has got his camera on now. We can see you, my friend. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Don't be. Um, perfect. The Reds, uh, speaking of more gambling at that time, how Chase, the Red Star first baseman, was well known to throw games. And also, the same year, 1919, Ty Cobb, Tris Speaker, and the Tigers and Cleveland Indians were um, even went to trial to see about um, how Cleveland, uh, through Detroit's bid to get third place and thus uh, prize money for finishing third. Um, that was disallowed, evidently, because Dutch Leonard refused to testify on it. So gambling was rampant around that area, from what I understand. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, that was, uh, those are the ones we know about. There's probably a lot more <laughs> that we don't know about. But no, I mean, it was it was very common, um, you know, for players to bet on their own teams. Um, you know, that was something that even the Sporting News in 1918 um, when the Hal Chase uh, hearing was was happening, um, you know, they, they actually reported in print, you know, editorialized um, that, you know, Hal Chase bet on the Reds uh, to win and they didn't see any problem with that um, as long as he was betting on them to win. Um, but, you know, as we discovered years later with Pete Rose, betting on them to win in some games doesn't mean that, you know, you're not uh, betting on them to lose in other games or, or vice versa. So, uh, that's it doesn't make it any better um, but you know I've said I've said all along you know you can't understand this entire scandal without knowing how intertwined baseball and betting were um, you know you could go to Wrigley Field and you could place a bet on the next pitch uh, from the bleachers you know just like you can today now you have to use a smartphone to do it today you couldn't do that in 1919 <laughs> um, but you know you could place a bet on what was happening in the fourth inning um, you know, in a Cubs Pirates game, you can also do that in 2024 as well. Um, and so, you know, th this was the atmosphere, this was the environment um, that the Black Sox players kind of grew up in. And, you know, they didn't really see much wrong with it. And they also didn't see anybody getting punished for it. You know, Hal Chase was caught red handed trying to bribe not only his own teammates, but also opponents uh, with Cincinnati Reds by his own manager, Christy Matheson. And the National League whitewashed it and, you know, didn't punish Chase at all. They allowed him to move on to the New York Giants. Uh, in 1919 with John McGraw. So, you know, for my money, you know, the Black Sox saw an opportunity to make some easy money. They thought it was a very low risk, uh, high reward proposition. Um, you know, they could make, you know, pretty decent amount of, of money in one week in October of 1919. And even if they got caught, they weren't going to get punished because who was ever punished for this? Um, Hal Chase wasn't, Ty Cobb wasn't. So, you know, why, why would anybody expect anything different? Um, but, you know, they, they bet wrong uh, and they did not foresee the, uh, you know, installation of Judge Landis uh, as commissioner the following year. They did not see, you know, how the winds had shifted. Um, and so, you know, they didn't realize that the spotlight was so much greater during the World Series. You know, baseball was the true national pastime. Um, and, you know, they got caught. And so they got punished and held up as an example. Um, but, you know, there were, there were quite a few opportunities uh, for baseball to have dealt with that um, in the years preceding the 1919 World Series. That was not the, uh, the first nor the only uh, incident of game fixing and gambling. Let's go to Mark Gold. Mark, so nice to have you this evening. How are you? Good. I'm good, Bruce. And thanks very much. Jacob, first off, it's great hearing you speak. When you speak on this subject, it's incredible hearing you speak on this stuff. It's great. Scandal on the South Side was such a is such a fantastic book. I didn't realize it's from 2015. It's not long ago that you that you that it was published because I just have it around all the time. You know, I could always look through and to get into the the uh, depths of all of the players and what they were like and what their life was like. It it's just fascinating. And then and further, what what you did last week or two weeks ago in, in the most recent report where you mentioned about the salaries 
that the white sucks salaries in 1919, but it's always been the thought that, well, they were paid so little and that's why they didn't like Comiskey because he was so cheap and that's why they wanted to do this and get the extra money. But the fact is, per you, was I believe they were either third highest salary in the league or the major leagues that year, which is, which is so fascinating. My question is this, did Joe ever say that he did not do his best to win and did he ever give any examples of what he did wrong or what he did to lose during the World Series? Um, you know, I'll have to go back through the 1920 testimony to see if he said those exact words. I'm not sure if it was exactly that, but uh, I know for a fact that Joe said in 1920 uh, during his grand jury testimony um, that they were trying to lose game three uh, with Dickie Kerr. They were trying to kick it, I think he said. Um, you know, so he, he absolutely, you know, said they were, you know, trying harder um to lose now again whether or not he actually did that once he took the field uh during the world series it's hard you know it's it's hard to say um there is some evidence uh back and forth about you know how he did in the clutch you know not driving in runners in scoring position um you know there's some questions about his fielding and his positioning uh in left field that have been you know around for 100 years so uh we'll probably still be debating that 100 years from now i don't know that there will ever be a definitive answer um on you know whether joe really did play his best um but you know he by his own testimony he said you know that we were trying to throw it we were trying to lose um you know and and he said we you know it was not it was not they uh the other black Sox. you know he was he considered himself in 1920 at least he considered himself to be part of the conspiracy to be part of the black Sox group um you know trying to fix the world series so i think you know in later years, including in this 1924 trial, he changed the story quite a bit. Um, but also so did some of the other White Sox, like Eddie Collins. Um, you know, early on in the scandal, Eddie Collins said, you know, oh, we didn't know anything was, or I'm sorry, early on in the scandal in 1920, Eddie Collins was like, oh yeah, we knew they were fixing, you know, we know we knew who was doing it. You know, we, we had, you know, all sorts of suspicions. And then later on, Eddie Collins was like, oh no, we had no idea. Nobody could have known, you know, everybody was innocent. Um, you know, so it was a lot of people change their stories, uh, a lot of different ways. But I think if you, you know, go back and read Joe's words, uh, the first time he was under oath when he was, you know, by himself, um, I think he, he basically admits, you know, everything he, he was part of it. He took the money, you know, he took the bribe. That was, that was it. So for a lot of people, I think that really clears it up on, you know, whether or not, you know, th did he play his best or not? It doesn't really matter. He, he took the money. He was part of the conspiracy. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's really the biggest part of it. I think maybe the, the next great thing you should do is write a book on the plays and the, yeah. the specifics that will take a few years to get into it, but specifically what he and the other players, how they, we know about the pitchers, but how the other players, did they swing and miss? Did they boot a ball intentionally? There's that, that great film from Canada that, was uh, the five minute, I guess that's the five minute film that you're talking about that was frozen under an ice rink, which that whole story was incredible. Well, you actually see, I couldn't pick it out. And I must have looked at it five times and I couldn't pick out what the, what the, what the error was. I think it was a throw that came in and it wasn't, it wasn't. Yeah, it was caught. a double, it was a double play ball. It was hit, hit back to the pitcher, Eddie Seacott, and he uh, made kind of a slow turn to second base and he threw it low uh, and right. Swede Risberg caught the low throw, and then he also double clutched uh, and threw it too slow to first base to get the double play and end the inning. And the Reds, that was game one, like, and the Reds scored five runs and knocked Seacott out uh, in the fourth inning of game one. But that play is part of that film footage uh, that was discovered. So um, unfortunately, we don't have, you know, much other film footage. So, you know, trying to go through, you know, play by play to figure out who did what, um, you know, people have been attempting to uh, go back through the you know, descriptions, through the box scores, through their own testimony. Um, you know, there's so many contradictions uh, is the problem. So everybody's going to have their own interpretation of, of what happened on the field. Um, so I think, you know, it's, uh, it's very enticing to try to go through all that. Um, but I'm not sure that it really changes anything because like I said, you know, ultimately, he was part of the conspiracy. He admitted it multiple times. He took the money, you know, whether or not he actually, you know, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, players make errors every day. Um, are they trying hard or do they just not get enough sleep last night or something? You know, I mean, there's, there's so many reasons that, you know, 
plays happen. Um, you know, even the clean socks in 1919, you know, didn't play well. So, you know, was that because they were distressed about their own teammates betraying them? Probably. Um, or did they just have a bad week? Uh, that happens too. That happens all the time uh, in baseball. So I think it's, uh, it's very, very difficult to go back a hundred years later and say, here's exactly what happened on the field um, at all times. I don't know that we're ever going to get quite that level of detail. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks, Mark. Karen Holleran. Karen, how you doing tonight, my friend? Fine. How are you? I am terrific. I'm so happy you're here. We finally got you in here. What's going on? Well, after listening to everything, my my initial question is, what is the one thing that everybody should know about the situation? Hmm, interesting. The, black the, sauce. the I mean, one takeaway it? I would say is that nobody in this entire scandal comes out looking good. Um, <laughs> everybody looks bad. Um, the players that fix the World Series, um, you know, their own manager and, and the executives of the White Sox, baseball officials, um, nobody looks good. Uh, Abe Battelle, the gambler, a former boxing champion, had the great line in Eight Men Out uh, that this was the story of cheaters cheating cheaters. Um, and that is absolutely true. There were double crosses on both sides. Um, you know, there, no, nobody comes out as looking good. Charles Comiskey does not look good. Van Johnson does not look good. Um, you know, the Black Sox players themselves, uh, this is, you know, it really is just kind of an ugly story, a black eye for baseball. Um, and, you know, this is also a story that can happen at any point. Um, again, will a future gambling scandal happen exactly like the Black Sox scandal? No, you know, too many, too much is different. Um, but, you know, can this happen to baseball again? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think the Houston Astros are very instructive uh, with the sign stealing a few years ago because, you know, this was a situation <laughs> where Major League Baseball had a lot of opportunities um, to put a stop to what the Astros and other teams were doing. Um, and they always, always chose to basically sleep, sweep it under the rug. Um, and the Astros, you know, took it too far. And that's kind of what the Black Sox did was, um, you know, games were being fixed. You know, there was gambling. Players were gambling on their own teams. Um, some players were caught and then just kind of given a slap on the wrist. Um, and then the White Sox took it way too far. Um, you know, they crossed a the line because they didn't think there was a line. And, you know, I think that's, um, you know, there's not a lot of similarities between the Astros and the White Sox, but I think that is one of them is that baseball had opportunities to, you know, nip this in the bud um, before it blew up. And then all of a sudden you've got the spotlight of the World Series um, and a team that, you know, really wants to take it too far. And I think, you know, th they basically, you know, got caught. And uh, this is, you know, something that baseball will have, again, future opportunities to deal with problems before they become bigger, um, you know, and, in general, baseball is not very good at doing that. Uh, they usually let these things go farther and farther until it's too late. So uh, I don't have a lot of confidence that baseball will handle this one <laughs> any better. Well, thank you so much. This and is now excellent. I'm going to go to my good friend, Dick Layden, who is here this evening. Dick, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing better. You look great, man. I'm so glad you're here. I have a judge and jury question, if you don't mind. Um, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. <laughs> what did the judge say to that jury? That they <laughs> they weren't seeing what was there? How did that happen? So you can read the exact words. I can't recite it from memory, um, but uh, you can read the exact words in the transcript in our book. Um, but basically what the judge said was, um, you know, that, that the, the witness's testimony, Shula's Joe's testimony, um, was based on a lie. Um, it was based on perjury because he told two very different versions of the Black Sox scandal story. Um, you know, in 1920, he told a version where, you know, he admitted everything, he confessed, uh, he took the money, all that. In 1924, he told a version that, you know, oh, I didn't even answer those questions. I wasn't even asked those questions. Um, and all of that is wrong. Um, and you know, both of those are under oath and you can't, <laughs> you can't say one thing under oath and then say a totally different version, uh, a couple of years later. And so, um, so yeah, he basically said, you know, you, you, the judge told the jury, you know, you disregarded, um, all of the testimony, all of the evidence here, because the evidence clearly shows Joe was lying, you know, again, 
whether it was in 1920 in Chicago or 1924 in Milwaukee. Um, he said, it doesn't matter what she said. He the judge believed that the lying testimony, the incorrect testimony was in Milwaukee. Um, but he said, it doesn't even matter. You know, you can't tell two versions under oath that are so wildly different uh, and contradictory. Um, and so, you know, he said the, the verdict that the jury brought back um, is based on perjury. Uh, so, you know, there's no way that they, you know, could have uh, done their jobs, you know, as a jury, um, you know, and so he, he basically lit them up uh, in that courtroom. And, <laughs> and he said, you know, we've talked to a lot of lawyers who have looked at this transcript uh, since it came out. And uh, just about every one of them has said that, you know, they've never heard a judge do that in their entire professional careers. Um, so this was pretty rare uh, for a judge to say that. It uh, tells you uh, just how infuriated he was uh, at the whole situation and at Joe and Happy Fellows, who basically did the same thing. They were both cited for perjury. Um, so, yeah, it's a uh, very, very rare occurrence in a courtroom. Uh, so I'm told. It helps your story. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. All right, let's go to uh, Dick Kramer, who's here this evening. Dick, how you doing? Very well, thanks. Uh, See ya. Jacob, you said there were no heroes. Well, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering whether there's anything about the, the White Sox manager, Kid Gleason. Uh, he was a hell of a player. He, he won 38 games one year, which nobody in Philadelphia ever did. Got 2,000 hits then when his arm gave out, became a second baseman. So is he anywhere a figure? He's actually a pretty big figure in the Eight Man Out movie. Does he show up in any of the transcripts or any of your research? He did not do. Uh, he 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 was not deposed or he did not testify for this particular trial. Um, he did take the stand briefly in the 1921 um, criminal trial, but it was mostly a, a procedural thing uh, for him. He didn't he didn't stay very long as a witness. Um, you know, as far as Gleason and and his kind of his actions during the trial, um, you know, I think everybody's in agreement generally that, you know, he did everything he could um, to stop this from happening um, as best he could, you know, without outright accusing his own players uh, publicly. Um, but behind the scenes, you know, he certainly, he, he went to Charles Comiskey uh, almost immediately. You know, there's reports that he threatened his own players uh, in the clubhouse, may have even gotten into a physical altercation um, with, with Chick Gandel or somebody else uh, during the World Series. So I think, you know, he knew what was happening. He tried to do his best uh, to put a stop to it. But, you know, the people, his players below him and his management above him, um, you know, none of them wanted this story to come out and none of them wanted uh, to deal with it. And so, you know, Gleason really didn't have a whole lot of power to do much. I think, you know, he's more of a sad figure, I think, in this entire scandal than anything else. You know, he was such a well-respected baseball man, you know, both as a player, as a coach, as a manager, uh, you know, as a, as a teacher uh, of baseball, um, you know, everybody respected him. And, and so for, you know, for this team uh, to do that under his management, you know, I think it's just, it's a very sad uh, story for him. You know, he certainly did not deserve uh, to be the manager of, of, a team that did this um and you know the forces that that made this happen were largely out of his control um, so he was a good guy anyway yeah absolutely you know so it's uh it, you know it's tough to see there's there's a lot of victims in scandals like this and i think you know again the the houston astros are instructive here um there's a lot of there's a lot of victims you know in a scandal like that um and you know the one of the moral and ethical reasons not to get involved in in this sort of thing and not to do this and not to you know uh, commit these types of transgressions, whether they are illegal, you know, or not, um, you know, you, you shouldn't betray your own teammates. You shouldn't betray your manager. Um, you know, those are, those are ethical impulses, you know, that human beings, you know, have to make decisions on every single day, um, on all sorts of things. And, and that's, you know, that's a, absolutely a failing of, of those, you know, eight players, um, and everyone else, you know, who was involved in these types of things. So, uh, so yeah, Gleason was, was definitely a, a victim, you know, in that. And so were Ray Shock and Eddie Collins and, and all the, the clean teammates as well. You know, the, um, you know, one thing that we pointed out in the eight minutes out project in regards to the salaries is that, you know, 
it has been said for many years that the reason the Black Sox did this is because they were so poorly paid uh, and poorly treated. And the reality is none of that is true. They were extremely well paid um, and treated very similarly to every other player in the major leagues. You know, Connie Mack and the Philadelphia A's, uh, you know, Connie Mack was was a much worse owner, um, you know, to his own players than Charles Comiskey ever was. So if any team, you know, should have uh, conspired to, you know, try to make some extra money. It was the Philadelphia A's um, under Mac. You know, the Comiskey paid his players fine. He treated them just like everybody else did. Um, that doesn't mean they were treated great under the reserve clause system um, in that era, but, you know, Comiskey treated them just fine. And so, you know, they didn't, any other team, any other group of players could have chosen to do this, uh, and they did not. The White Sox did choose to do this. Um, and so, you know, that's on them. Our last one for tonight is Dixie Tarango. We're going to go back to Dixie. You're up. Uh, Jacob, following up on that last question, could the newspaper reporters be looked upon as the closest thing to heroes in this story? Um, you know, there were certainly some reporters. Uh, Hugh Fullerton is the most famous one, um, you know, who, who did try to spread the word and, and get it out there. Um, Burt Collier in Chicago uh, had a you know, small gambling trade publication uh, called Collier's Eye. I mean, he named the players within weeks of the World Series. He named the seven accused Black Sox publicly. Um, so there were certainly reporters who were trying, you know, to get it out there. Um, you know, as far as heroes or not, I mean, they were trying to do their jobs. Um, but again, the reporters also had, you know, many opportunities um, to kind of, you know, put a stop or at least raise some public concern um, about, you know, not only the 1919 World Series, but some of the preceding scandals. Um, and, you know, everybody in baseball kind of looked the other way. I think, you know, again, any any scandal, uh, you know, like this, uh, steroids and PEDs in the 1990s, you know, a lot of people had a lot of opportunities to say, hey, we're not going to let this, you know, go as far as it, do as it did. Um, and, you know, for many reasons and many motivations, uh, a lot of people, you know, chose not to do that. So, it's it's unfortunate. I mean, it you know went down the way it did, but uh, you know I think you know it's great that we do have a lot of uh, reporting on this scandal, and you know it was you know major uh, news, major headlines, you know for years and years afterwards, um, including you know this nineteen twenty four trial um, got a lot of headlines as well. So you know it's great to to see all that, but you know you can always uh, years later look back in hindsight and say, well, somebody should have done this or somebody should have done more. Um, it's a very, very different thing to say that in real time, uh, not knowing, you know, what's going to happen in the future and not knowing how we're all going to look back on on this type of story. So uh, I don't want to fault anybody uh, at that time for not doing something that we think they should have done. Um, you know, they uh, some of them did the best they could and some of them did the worst they could. So that's uh, that's how it goes just with just about every story. I'm going to get one more in tonight. And the reason I'm doing it is because this guy won the big contest at uh, the, the last Sabre convention for five years, free attendance and all of this. So I, I, I guess he's a big shot now. I got to get him in. Francis Kinlaw, how you well, doing this evening, my friend? <laughs> I'm not a big shot, but if I were, it was with a little quest. Uh, and I hope, uh, you know, in light of uh, I hope I won't delay this. Uh, Jacob, uh, are, were there interest, any interesting comments from the Reds players about what transpired? Absolutely. No, that's uh, one of the more interesting things, uh, you know, that, that I think we've been able to uncover, especially in re recent years, as more newspapers have been digitized and uh, made available online. Um, we've been able to discover almost 150 interviews of the 1919 White Sox or Reds players um, combined, over 150 interviews, I believe. Um, and so, yeah, they were very open about it. Uh, Ed Roush in particular, because he lived for such a long time um, uh, until 1988, I believe. And uh, so, yeah, Roush and, and some of the other players were uh, very vocal about the fact that, um, you know, they were they resented the White Sox for, you know, not playing on the level and for not uh, allowing the Reds to be able to celebrate, you know, what they felt was a deserved championship. Um, and, you know, again, the, the Reds players to a man felt like they could have beaten the White Sox fair and square. 
uh, especially with that deep pitching staff. So, uh, the, so they were very vocal, um, you know, some of them uh, about, about the scandal and, you know, about the betrayal. Um, and, you know, again, the betrayal, the fact that uh, nobody really thinks the 1919 Reds were deserving champions. They think, you know, the White Sox would have blown them out. And that's one of the myths that has, you know, popped up is that the White Sox were this, you know, absolute super team that, you know, destroyed all comers, um, you know, which wasn't true. They were a very, very good team and they had just won a World Series in 1917. Um, but they were a flawed team and they were not a very deep team. Uh, they were relied very heavily on their eight starters uh, in the lineup and their two top pitchers, um, Eddie Seacott and Lefty Williams. And so, you know, they could be beaten. Um, and I think that's something that, uh, you know, the Reds, the Reds knew too. Uh, they were very confident going into that World Series. And I think, you know, they absolutely couldn't have beat them fair and square. And that's something they said uh, for many, many years afterwards. Thank you, Jacob. Yes. Well, this has been quite a presentation with some of the best Q&A that I've had the uh, pleasure of being involved with. I want to take a moment to uh, thank everyone on the call this evening for such a great meeting. And I want to remind everybody that Thursday, February 1st, we get together again at 730 for the Immaculate Grid Tournament. I'll be sending out links to that uh, tomorrow. Saturday is Saber Day. Don't forget that. We're going to get our Saber Day program out to everybody once again uh, tomorrow, but go to saber.org slash events to click the Saber Day link and you will see everybody's Saber Day programs, including ours. We have three fantastic presentations that day. Now, next Monday, February 5th at 7 p.m., we have yet another fabulous guest. We have the privilege of meeting with the best dressed host in all of sports, the young professor himself, Matt Grafer. Matt is the chief potassium enthusiast of the Savannah Bananas and an integral part of the team's on-field presentation. This meeting has been a year in the making, and you're not going to want to miss out on some of the fascinating inner workings and some of the fun involved with the Savannah Bananas. Don't miss out on that. Jacob Pomeranke, this has been absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you very much for this. You're the greatest. Thank you, Bruce. And, you know, I'll put in a plug for our Sabre Black Sox committee. Uh, there are so many people doing some great work, you know, including some here tonight. You know, none of what we do could be possible without all of these people. Um, you know, a lot of my work, a lot of my, my research, you know, is built off the great work, you know, that Bill Lamb and Bruce Allardyce and Don Zaminda and Rick Hune and a lot of other people are doing. Um, and so, you know, this is something that is is a group effort. Um, you know, it is really a, a, a big team, um, you know, putting all this stuff out there and keeping the story alive and, and learning all the new things uh, that we learn. Um, so if you want to be a part of this committee and uh, be part of this and, um, you know, contribute to our newsletter, contribute to our discussion uh, group or anything else, um, you know, feel free to uh, send me an email or, or drop me a line and, and let me know. And I'll be happy to help you uh, get started because this is something that, you know, I continue to learn just as much from everyone else's work. Uh, as I hope other people learn from mine. So this is, uh, you know, one of the best parts about uh, Saber is finding people, you know, who are really smart and really good at, at digging things up um, and, you know, learning something. I learned something new from a Saber member every single day. So uh, thank you all for uh, being part of this and all the great questions. And uh, I will see you down the line somewhere. Yes, you will, Jacob. Thank you very much. I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Jacob very, very much. We'll see everybody throughout the week. Let's get everybody out of here. I want to say good night to everybody. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you.